Vítajte pri počúvaní podcastu Ines. Všetky naše ďalšie podcasty si môžete vypočuť na stránke ines.sk lomitko audio. Prajeme vám príjemné počúvanie. Dnešná epizóda je rozhovor s Raulom Ruparelom, spoluriaditeľom britského think tanku Open Europe, na tému referenda o vystúpení Veľkej Británie z Európskej únie. Raul Ruparel vystúpil na medzinárodnej konferencii o konkurencie schopností, ktorú na sklonku minulého roka organizoval Ines. So I welcome in our office uh, Mr. Raul Ruparel from Open Europe, uh, one of the most important economic think tanks in the United Kingdom and definitely the most important one in shaping uh, the relations of uh, London and Brussels. And our topic for this podcast uh, is obviously Brexit. Um, the very first question, when will be the referendum? Well, I think that's a question everyone is asking. Um, our base case is that the referendum will still be sometime at the end of uh, 2016. So between September 2016 and December 2016. I think the negotiations are likely to run beyond December. And that means it's unlikely there can be a referendum in June or early summer. Uh, and if you go into 2017, obviously you have the French and German elections when uh, both governments have told the UK they shouldn't hold the referendum to, uh, to conflict with their campaigns. Uh, so that, at the end of 2016, looks the most likely. Obviously, this also depends, though, on things such as the migration crisis. If you have a summer of uh, a very serious migration crisis, Um, there is a fear that that would boost the people wanting to leave uh, and boost the risk of Brexit if there was a referendum right after that. Is it possible to tell who are the allies and who are the enemies in the negotiations of the potential reforms of EU? Well, I think you can uh, guess a bit where countries stand. Um, there is not uh, a clear cut on, on the whole package, but I think on different issues we have different allies. Clearly, uh, you know, the, lots of countries are on board with the single market and competitiveness agenda, um, but they talk a good game. They don't always deliver in terms of uh, backing up the single market. Uh, lots of countries, I think, uh, agree on the need to address this issue of uh, differences between euro and non-euro countries. Uh, there's support for that in Germany and also in some of the other non-euro states, such as Sweden uh, and even Poland but differences over how it should be done technically. I think on the issue of national parliaments and giving them a greater say, again, lots of countries are in theory behind this principle, trying to make the EU more democratic, uh, but some countries that traditionally look very heavily to Europe, uh, in particular Belgium and even Spain, have voiced some serious concerns about uh, introducing another check into the process of EU decision-making. Uh, so it's quite varied. Uh, and then on the idea of changing ever closer union, you know, some countries are willing to work with the UK on it. Uh, again, Germany, even France, I think, because they don't hold this as such a big issue, whereas in the UK it's, it's seen as much more important. But again, some of the more federalist countries, Belgium, Luxembourg, um, are quite concerned about changing this part of the treaties or changing this concept of ever close union for the EU. So uh, it's a mixed bag, but on the whole, I think we see that countries are open to Cameron's agenda, willing to hear what he has to say, but there's not many countries that will go out and, and uh, you know, bang the drum for him and make his case for him. He'll have to do much of the legwork on his own. What about East European countries? For example, the new Polish government maybe more in uh, Mr. Cameron's way? Well, I think certainly on, on some issues, the new Polish government will be beneficial for Cameron and his reform push. I think they are certainly more in line on issues such as national democracy, on reforming the EU, uh, and maybe trying to limit its scope of political influence. But equally, we still have these differences on the migration issue. Uh, David Cameron has said he wants to limit the access to benefits in work for EU migrants. Obviously, given the large number of, of migrants from Eastern Europe in, in the UK, there is concern that this would disadvantage their citizens. So I think there are still some strong differences uh, 
with the UK and Poland and other Eastern European states on that. So that is definitely the most challenging part of his renegotiation package. And I think um, only time will tell if, if that can be agreed and the UK may have to offer something in return to try and get support from these member states. Just to summarize for our listeners, there are four main or general topics, uh, reform topics, which the, new, which the UK government wants to renegotiate. Uh, it's the migration, and the migration benefits, uh, it's the red tape or the bureaucracy of EU, uh, it's the, the clear definition of EU and national competencies or so-called ending the ever closer union. And the fourth topic is uh, some kind of autonomy of non-Eurozone uh, members within EU, which uh, in a certain way feel endangered by the, by the Eurozone, the stronger, the bigger Eurozone group. You already said uh, which of these topics is probably the most difficult to, to negotiate, but which of these topic is the most important for UK and for, and for British voters? Well, I think for the voters, the most important is the most difficult, the immigration. This has become a very symbolic issue and most voters rank immigration top of their concerns in terms of policy and issues that concern them in the UK. So I think David Cameron has to come back with something on this topic. If he doesn't get any movement, if he doesn't get any kind of agreement, then it will be very hard for him to get support, support for his package and very hard for him to um, get a, a win or to lead the in campaign in the referendum. Um, so that is the most important from a public perception. I think the issue of Euro ins and outs and finding a clearer settlement between the Eurozone and non-Eurozone countries is very important from a business perspective and from a long-term position of the UK in the EU. I think there is a, a growing fear in the UK that the Eurozone can caucus and outvote the UK and that it is very much setting the running of what is happening in the EU. Uh, that's understandable given the crisis and the challenges the Eurozone faces, but I think it has to be made certain that this will not have any negative spillover effects on the countries outside of the Eurozone and that it's still possible to be a full member of the single market and of the EU but not of the Eurozone. Um, and I think that will be a very important settlement because if there isn't an answer found to that question, I think it's likely the UK will leave the EU, maybe not in this referendum but in the not too distant future. What's the what's the position of, of British business on potential of, of uh, UK leaving uh, the EU? Because on the one side we often hear lamentations that without the the close connection with EU the, the business can be endangered. On the other hand, there are also strong supporters of the campaigns for the for the leave vote. Mm. Well, we are seeing businesses split a bit on this issue. I think traditionally big business and the business, businesses that export heavily to Europe are very pro-EU and are certainly in favour of staying in. Um, but the smaller and medium-sized businesses are less certain about the prospect and are quite split on the issue. And I think if you are a business that is focused on the UK or, or even on an international market outside of the EU, um, you don't really see the benefit of the single market, but you still face the costs in terms of the regulation Uh, and the burden that is placed on businesses. So uh, I think that is one of the concerns. We also have to look at the areas where the single market works well and where it doesn't work well. So if you are a goods business and an exporter of goods, then you have a very good market to tap into and clearly the single market works well for you. But if you are a services business, the single market works less well. Um, even in financial services, finan uh, the financial services market works very well for large wholesale international companies, um, but less well for smaller uh, firms such as asset managers and hedge funds. And I think that's why we're seeing a split between larger businesses and different sectors uh, supporting uh, in or out. Let's imagine uh, that the UK really leaves you. Uh, what are the options for the new kind of relations uh, with the EU and which, which would you prefer the most and which would you consider the biggest disaster? Well, I think the fundamental question outside the EU is getting this trade-off between access to the single market and also influence 
or control over the rules of that market. And there's no obvious model that works very well. Um, if we look at the models that exist at the moment, the Swiss model is very complicated. It's a series of bilateral deals. Uh, and it... Um, and it takes a long time to negotiate. It took 10 years to negotiate. Um, so it's not clear that it would be available for the UK in the short term. Uh, I think it also has limited access in terms of financial services, which many people don't realize. If we look at the Norway model, you get good access to the single market, um, but you don't get any say over the rules. And I think many people um, are concerned that if we took the Norway model, we'd have to accept all the rules of the single market, but without a say over how those rules are made. Um, so those two off the peg models that already exist don't really look ap applicable for the UK. I think if you look outside of that, we could have a more uh, new age free trade agreement, such as the one with Canada or the one being negotiated with the US. These all inclusive free trade agreements cover a number of areas, they're living agreements, um, and they have some level of arbitration and investor settlement in, in you know, maybe in an arbitration court. Um, but even then, there are big questions. There's no free trade agreement that offers full access on financial services, obviously a big sector for the UK. Um, it's also not clear, um, you know, whether we would have to accept some level of free movement, which both Norway and Switzerland do have to accept, or if we would still have to contribute to the EU budget, which um, the you know both Norway and Switzerland do as well. So I think there are lots of unanswered questions about what the model could and, and should look like. I think there would be one that could be found. I think it's likely we could get an agreement on goods um, and, and be part of the single market in that area. It's less certain on services and particular financial services. Uh, but I think, you know, for me, the worst case would be a Norway model would probably be quite bad for the UK as I just don't think it delivers the right kind of access and sovereignty balance. I think you get some access, um, but you don't get any control and, and that's not something which is realistic for a country the size of the UK. Well, one question is, uh, is uh, the economics. The second question is the politics. Uh, are you not afraid that uh, Brussels, in a, in a fear of some kind of chain reaction of EU separatism, uh, will try to impose, uh, let's say, very very limited uh, connections to the UK to cut the UK from from the open market or something similar? It's certainly a risk, and I think uh, this is clearly a very political process. So. Uh, you know, the UK leaving the EU would be a big blow to the political project and it would be an insult to many countries, I believe, or that's how it might be seen. So I think it, certainly we have to consider the proposition in the short term that um, the UK would not get a great deal or that countries would not want to give it a great deal. I would hope eventually economic rationality would prevail, not guaranteed, but over time we think it would make sense to get, get a deal in goods, but even then I think the services is much more complicated uh, and uh, you know the UK has a huge surplus in services and financial services so uh, there might be an incentive for other countries to try and move some of the euro trading and euro business that takes place in London back inside the eurozone uh, so it's a very complicated political process and I think it's not certain how it would play out. Mm, probably the uh the strongest support for uh, remaining in the EU is in, is in Scotland. Uh, do you think that if, uh, if the UK left, uh, the Scotland we would try to uh, have a referendum on independence again? I think it's very likely there would try to be another referendum on independence. I think um, there would need to be a very clear and big difference between Scotland and the rest of the UK, but that is possible, as you said. Uh, uh, however, I'm not sure whether if they did have this referendum, it would be won. I think you have to look at the fact that Scotland would be leaving both a customs union and a trade union as the UK left the EU, and then also leaving a currency and debt union by leaving the UK uh, at a time when its main resource in oil is at record low prices. And, you know, those three economic shocks on a very small country are very serious. So I'm not certain it would be an easy referendum to win. 
Add in the fact that Scotland may not be able to join the EU very quickly. You have the issue of Spain not wanting to set a precedence for Catalonia. Uh, you have lots of other complications. Uh, and it may not be obvious that you know it's voting to leave the EU, UK to stay in the EU. So I think it, it, it might be a hard referendum to win. Nonetheless, at a time where there's a big disruption in the UK leaving the EU, do you really want to have that disruption on top of another referendum in Scotland with the uncertainty? So it would, it would make a, an already complex situation more complex. And the last question. Why is it the UK who holds the flag of Euroscepticism in Europe? Well, I think the UK's history in Europe has been very different. Um, I think we came to the project obviously looking at it from a different perspective. Uh, we've had a much stronger view of our national institutions, national democracy, whereas I think a lot of other countries in continental Europe that came to the EU at a time where their national institutions and national democracy had failed or been found wanting. Uh, add on to that the fact that when the UK joined and also decided to stay in in the 1975 referendum, it was very much presented as being part of um, the common market, being part of the single market, rather than being part of this political union. Um, and so I think it's always been viewed as a different relationship. I like to see it as the UK views it as a business relationship, whereas the rest of Europe views it as a marriage. Uh, so you approach it in very different ways. And I think that explains why we're always seen as being a bit of an awkward partner. Mr. Rupal, thank you for a very interesting interview. Thank you.